Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for May 8th, and we begin today in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, I have been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things that you are doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But the Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. And again, we know from uh, the rules and laws and numbers that Eli should have put his sons to death himself for his sake and for the nation's sake. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Very similar words that we hear describing Jesus in his life as a young man. One day, a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to your priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priests, but I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who think lightly of me. The time is coming when I will put an end to your family, so it will no longer serve as my priests. All the members of your family will die before their time. None will reach old age. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel, but no members of your family will ever live out their days. Those who survive will live in sadness and grief, and their children will die a violent death. To prove what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family, and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so that we will have enough to eat. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Levi. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I am going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God, and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. Samuel stayed in bed until morning, then got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him, but Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son. Here I am, Samuel replied. What did the Lord say to you? 
Tell me everything, and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold anything back. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Notice how uh, they are treating the Ark here as a good luck charm. It will save us, rather than an opportunity to seek the Lord, that he would save them. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. What's going on? the Philistines asked. What's all that shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because of the Ark of the Lord that had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help, who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrews' slaves, just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. Thirty thousand Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later that same day. He had torn his clothes and put dust on his head to show his grief. Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the Ark of God. When the messenger arrived and told what had happened, an outcry resounded throughout the town. "'What's all the noise about?' Eli asked. The messenger rushed over to Eli, who was ninety-eight years old and blind. He said to Eli, "'I have just come from the battlefield. I was there this very day.' "'What happened, my son?' Eli demanded. "'Israel has been defeated by the Philistines,' the messenger replied. "'The people have been slaughtered, and your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed.' And the Ark of God has been captured. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to the Ark of God, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and died, for he was old and overweight. He had been Israel's judge for forty years. Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of her delivery. When she heard that the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She died in childbirth, but before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy. But she did not answer or pay attention to them. She named the child Ichabod, which means, Where is the glory? For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named him this because the Ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Then she said, The glory has departed from Israel. For the ark of God has been captured. John 5, beginning in verse 24. Jesus is speaking. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God. And those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself and has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. 
Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just, because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me, and I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his messages, his message in your hearts, because you do not believe me, the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me and re receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet isn't it I who will accuse you before the Father? Moses, it isn't I, sorry, who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed in Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can ever praise him enough? There is joy for those who deal justly with others and always do what is right. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come near and rescue me. Let me share in the prosperity of your chosen ones. Let me rejoice in the joy of your people. Let me praise you with those who are your heritage. Like our ancestors, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. Our ancestors in Egypt were not impressed by the Lord's miraculous deeds. They soon forgot his many acts of kindness toward them. Instead, they rebelled against him at the Red Sea. Even so, he saved them to defend the honor of his name and to demonstrate his mighty power. He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led Israel across the sea as if it were a desert. So he rescued them from their enemies and redeemed them from their foes. Then the water returned and covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promises. Then they sang his praise. Proverbs 14, 30-31 uh, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. And to end, we are looking today with Selwyn Hughes at the DIY syndrome, which comes from Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. You did not honor the Lord who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Yesterday I said that most Christians do not pant after God in the way the psalmist described in Psalm 42.1. Now I must attempt to make clear what I mean. First, let me pull into focus the major problem with which we all struggle as soon as we are born. When God created us in the beginning, he designed us to have a relationship with himself. This means that deep within our being is a thirst for God which will not go away. It can be ignored, disguised, misunderstood wrongly labeled or submerged under a welter of activity, but it will not disappear. And for good reason. 
we were designed to enjoy something better than this world can give us, particularly in the sphere in the sphere of relationships. No human relationship can satisfy the way that a relationship with God satisfies. This deep thirst for God that resides within us makes us dependent on God for satisfaction, and that is something our sinful nature deeply resents. You see, due to Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden, we have all been left a legacy called do-it-yourself. There is something within every single one of us that wants to take charge and have a hand in bringing about our own salvation. So here is the problem. To face the fact realistically that we inwardly thirst after God puts us in touch with a level of helplessness from which our sinful human nature shrinks. It reinforces the conviction that we are dependent on someone else, someone outside ourselves for satisfaction. And that is something we don't care to acknowledge. Oh, our Father, we recognize this elemental drive in our natures that causes us to resist standing in utter helplessness before you. But we sense that there can be no breakthrough in our lives until we face this issue and deal with it. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all. Have a beautiful day.